All right, and as as folks are logging in here, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. So I should say I'm Alex Tarantino. I'm a PDI board member and the chair of the Education Committee. So welcome and thanks so much for attending today. Um, this session is called Recognizing Black Historical Sites in Delaware. So we've got some really great presentations lined up for you all. Um, big thanks to Tetra Tech as one of our sponsors today for their support. Um, so before we get started, so we're going to run through all of the presentations and then we'll take questions at the end. So attendees can ask questions using the question and answer function, which is that little button you'll see at the bottom of your screen um, for Dr. Gooch, our chair, to, to take those questions um, and ask them to the presenters at the end. Um, aside from that today, we just want to welcome if you are not currently a member of PDI and would be interested in doing so, we can post some information in the chat today for you to become a member. Your support really helps us to put on and facilitate events like these um, and further preservation efforts in Delaware. So it looks like we've got a decent number of people logged in here. Um, again, if you have any questions for the presenters, put them in the Q&A. If you need to get in touch with the panelists, you can also use the chat box in a pinch as well. Um, but besides that, I think I'll pass it over to our chair, Dr. Cheryl Renee Gooch. Thank you, Alex, and welcome colleagues and neighbors to this session of our conference. Of course, our theme is preservation and progress. Recognizing Black historical sites in Delaware. I'm Cheryl Renee Gooch, a PDI member and moderator for the session. We have two presentations that will precede our Q&A. Uh, the first presentation is by colleague and um, long uh, time professional uh, historical preservationist here in Delaware. She has a very long uh, and distinguished career as both an educator and a uh, researcher. Robin Kroritz, who currently serves as the uh, historian, a historian for the National Park Service, her presentation entitled, More to Uncover, Using the National Park Service Network to Freedom to Help Reveal Delaware's Missing Stories. We also have a presentation by our colleagues, Reverend uh, Vince, Dr. Reverend Dr., excuse me, Vincent Oliver, Senior Pastor of New Calvary Baptist Church and member Ms. Edith Pridgen, who will be on hand with Robin to uh, field questions. So we'll begin with Robin Krowitz. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oops. Okay. Oops. I don't think I'm at the beginning, I'm sorry. Apologies. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. My name is Robin Krowitz. Um, I'm the regional coordinator for the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom program, um, along with Kamel McLaren, who is, and the reason there's two of us is it's a heck of a sized territory. We go from Maine to Virginia. So we're here to help you uh, with the Network to Freedom um, under in all aspects and um, look forward to working with you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Network to Freedom can help Delaware um, uncover, which is our um, histories of the enslaved. We have looked at um, 
the resistance through is to, through escape and flight for across, from across the country for um, over 20 years now. And um, so there's a lot of methodology in our program. A lot of people have um, done a lot of designations. And so it's always important to remember that Delaware was a place of enslavement and also that Delawareans gave assistance to the enslaved beginning in the 18th century. Uh, we use the term Underground Railroad, even though it's a little bit of a um, regional term for the Northeast to talk about um, this assistance methods, because that's what people used at the time, um, either talking about how movement occurred within the system, but also um, upon reflection. People like Harriet Tubman and um, Frederick Douglass use the term, so we continue with that in our program. Um, the Network to Freedom Act was passed in 1998, and um, our program is to coordinate preservation and education programs nationwide to support community efforts and facilitate dialogue and discussion around these issues. Um, and I hope you all will take advantage. So what can be put in the network? Um, there are sites, which are the places that have a documented association with the Underground Railroad, facilities that are places where you can go research that history, and then programs, which are how the story is told, how people are using that history to tell the story. In Delaware, there are 16 listings. Um, there are 12 sites, two facilities, which and the facilities I've taken advantage of many times myself in my own research, and two programs. Uh, programs tend to be a little more ephemeral, so you need to check on that they still exist and are up and running, but um, that's what we've got in the network so far. Um, the two properties you're looking at here are both Network to Freedom members, um, Appaquinnah Mink Friends Meeting House and Newcastle Courthouse are both areas of deep uh, study for me here um, since the 90s and uh, led me on the path to uh, continuing my knowledge in this area and doing research. So what we do in the network, we designate properties and we have two rounds per year. I always think of our submission deadlines as being Martin Luther King's birthday and Juneteenth. Those are the ways you can think about when those when your applications are due. Um, our next round is number 43, which is sort of mind blowing. But as you can see, there's a lot of places um, in the network, but uh, all over the country, including uh, Hawaii and in the Virgin Islands. Uh, we also, but you can also see there's a lot of work we have yet to do. The Network to Freedom has a grant a um, aspect to it, although we, it's not available every year, it's available often, and you can find out what, uh, when those grants are available through our website, which is, the link is down there. Um, NTF is our, um, after nps.gov, but we also have an email, a newsletter that you can sign up for and hear what's going on in our program and what's going on within our partnership network. Um, the grant amounts are from 1,000 to 10,000. The uh, match is not necessarily required. And um, we actually have a round coming up this year being supported by the National 400 Plus Commission um, and so we're actually looking at being able to document or to fund Network to Freedom applications for the first time. So it's kind of an exciting change and opportunity for us and for you. And uh, recently, um, our, our last Delaware grant recipient was the Tilly Escape Site in Seaford at the, um, with the Seaford Historical Society. So we're excited about what that will bring. I won't give you any spoilers, but it'll be fabulous when they're done. One program that we uh, started 
recently, or we've joined recently actually, because it was started by the state of Maryland who um, are very interested in their position as the preeminent underground railroad location in the world, in their opinion. Um, they have very good reason and basis um, to, to have that, but that doesn't mean the rest of us aren't on this journey as well. But um, what this International Underground Railroad Month does is it brings to uh, forward the connections into lands outside the United States. And this year we partnered with the Canadian Embassy who has a photography exhibit of descendants of uh, freedom seekers who are in Canada now that's um, available until February of next year. And the reason that's important, because that drove that um, our, our program created a story map to highlight the routes of the individual descendants, the people who escaped enslavement along the and along the routes through which they traveled to get to Canada. And one person they interviewed was a gentleman, J.R. Jackson, um, who's now passed away from Ontario. Um, and so in creating the story map, I was asked about his, um, the person from whom he descended, a woman named Anne Maria Jackson. And um, that's whose story I want to tell you today because she's the one whose story is untold. Um, William Still, if you are familiar, um, William Still was the, uh, the hub of the Underground Railroad in our region based in Philadelphia. He uh, published a book in 1872 of the stories he'd collected from people who traveling through along the Underground Railroad through his office, through his care. And those stories, um, he was compelled to, to create this book and collect stories in order to connect people who'd been separated on the, on the Underground Railroad based on his own experience with finding a long lost brother who'd been sold into enslavement when his, when his parents escaped um, many, many years before. So connecting family was very, very important to William Still. And um, Anne uh, Maria Jackson is one of those stories. Now it's likely that this was a photograph of the family that was turned into a lithograph this is not a creation, in my opinion, based on some of the other images I've seen from the, um, from the book, some of the images survive. So um, this is very, very close to what we can actually think that she looked like. Her story was taken down in a lot of detail. And I wanna talk to you about my efforts to document what she said. And I want to think about where we, you know, we as preservationists want to find places to put these stories on the landscape. Um, the, the landscape we're talking about is big. It's Murder Kill 100. It's south of Dover. It basically runs from the Camden area down to Frederica. Um, in 1855, these, this area was divided into two hundreds, um, north and south Murder Kill. But um, the landscape that of research was the entirety of Murder Kill Hundred, um, which is actually a place we have a lot of well documented Underground Railroad effort. So Anne Maria lived under the same roof as her children. Um, her enslaver. It's interesting to think about because I hadn't thought of this before, really researching this. But what her enslaver did was delegate the responsibility to take care of his chattel, his property, to Anne Maria and her husband. And so they lived apart. The enslaver was not part of their daily routines. And so when, as he wrote, when William still wrote in the fall, Prior to escape, she lost her husband because he had basically lost his mind 
And why? Because two of her children were, were her enslaver showed up, took her two oldest children and sold them south. And with, and that um, lack of control made him very, um, one can only imagine. I mean, it's just a, a, a horrific story. She talks about how she was never happy. She was happy, that's a terrible word. She was never at ease, as she said, is the word she used. Once she started having children and realized the implications of what that meant, she was trying to get her husband to leave with her and to, um, to take their freedom earlier, but, she, but he didn't. And so um, once he was out of the picture, she decided to do it herself, especially when she found out that her enslaver was about to take another four of her remaining seven children. And so she talks about in detail who this man was that enslaved her, what he looked like, um, and details that some were easily to, were e not easy, but were, I was able to confirm but some clearly not. Um, and also to be able to identify who her husband actually was. So I wanna talk about the methods about how to find that. Um, so she mentions the name of her enslaver who was Joseph Brown, which is a fairly common name in Delaware. So, but what I was able to find was that in comprehensive tax assessments, county tax assessments that he was listed as an owner of enslaved property. And he did have people in the, and the reason tax assessments are important and not um, census records is because in tax assessments, they list the names sometimes of the enslaved people. So we were lucky in that this assessment, these two assessments did have names in, in the record. And in 37, there's a Maria who's age 17. And then in 1845, an Anne. Um, and William still mentions that Anne would have been around 40 years old in 1858 when she took her freedom. And this, the, these people fit that element. Um, we're also lucky because Delaware is a small pool of data and that you can be pretty comprehensive in how you assess what's available in front of you. Um, she, she said that her enslaver lived in Milford and was a widower and rich. Um, I could not find him in Milford, uh, but he paid no poll tax in uh, Murder Kill 100. So he may not have lived there, but the major, a, a large amount of his property was there. Um, we do know that a woman named Sally Ann Brown was the wife of Joseph, A. Joseph Brown, and she's buried in Barrett's Chapel Cemetery. She died in 1839. So at this point, point he would have been a widower. Um, and in 1845, he was assessed for over $3,000 in property and with a lot of, of it focused in Frederica. Um, and so clearly he was wealthy. And if you wanna know what these look like, this is the page for Joseph Brown from the 1845 tax assessment. And this is available at Delaware Public Archives. So finding out who her husband was, she didn't mention his name in the account. And so, I remembered that Delaware Public Archives had some records from the county poorhouse, and I was really, really lucky that they put them online. Um, they're in their di digital archives assessment now. The poorhouse was where people who were indigent for any reason were placed in the county. And there's a, a road outside of uh, Wyoming, Delaware called Alms House Road. And that is the location of where our county, the Kent County's Alms House was. Um, the records there showed for Murder Kill 100 
two African Americans, males with the last name Jackson. One was Anthony, who was age 33, but listed as a cripple in the records that survived from that period. The other, which I consider to be the more likely candidate, was John Jackson, who at age 45 um, was brought in in 1854 with the diagnosis of crazy, and he died there uh, two years later. Um, and the timing fits with what Anna Maria said about her husband's death prior to, his, to her taking her freedom with her children. And here's what that record looks like. The records for the almshouse are divided by county and by race. So you can, they're searchable in that way. Um, I apologize for the bad image, uh, but this is what I was able to download. If you, you can see his um, one, two, three, four down, three down from the top is John Jackson. And his, his assessment is that he is crazy and he died on September 15th. John Jackson also appeared in the 1845 tax assessment. Um, he had a poll tax, but no property assessed in any, of any sort. And so um, one method I tried to identify where he might've lived was to review all the other assessments in Murder Kill 100 to see if anybody noted him as his, as their tenant on which a lot of assessments do, a lot don't as well. So unfortunately I was not able to pin this down. So this is an area for further work. So our research, there's still a lot more to do in Kent County, but the good news for this horrific story is that by um, the end by the 21st of November in 1858, um, Thomas Garrett in Wilmington was able to report that he had passed along Anne Maria Jackson and her seven children. How they got to him is not clear. If they were based near Frederica or anywhere in Murder Kill 100 actually, they would have had access to the existing Underground Railroad agents that were there. Um, including John Hun, who was a prosecuted agent. The, peop the only people we really know are the ones who, who paid a penalty for having been um, on the Underground Railroad. And that, um, so there's a lot of people who were, who were working in Kent County that we probably do not know, but they, were, they managed, the family managed to get to William Still and um, were passed on. It, it seems like the, um, the older child was separated from the family once we look at their arrival in Canada 13 days later. So from this, we know how long it took for them to traverse the, that space once they were out of the Delaware area. And it helps us understand what people did, how they were worked, um, how they were, transmitted and um, helps us understand a little bit more about the Underground Railroad. So of course, many, many thanks to um, an appreciation for the work of William Still. And his descendants, um, Mr. Jackson, I look forward to working with him. Um, what I wanna do, um, as part of, National Under, of International Underground Railroad Month next year is work with the descendants, this descendant community and create a space and document um, a conversation between the descendants of Anne Maria Jackson, the descendants of Thomas Garrett and have the interviewer uh, be a um, one of the, another descendant of, of Underground Railroad participants. So um, thank you all very much. I wanted to put in a, a brief plug for the Underground Railroad Coalition of Delaware. Um, Deborah Martin at the city of Wilmington and Gloria Henry at John Dickinson Plantation are uh, contacts that you can use to, to find out what's going on with the coalition. And I wanted to share the contact for my colleague, Kamel McLaren. 
um, my contact, Diane Miller, who's the, the national program manager is based at the Harriet Tubman National Park in Maryland. So she's readily accessible as well. And she lives in Seaford. Um, so she's, she's come over the line into Delaware. Um, and at the bottom, the network to freedom, oh, uh, network underscore to underscore freedom at nps.gov is how you can sign up for our quarterly newsletter. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Robin, for that detailed um, uh, presentation about um, Ms. Jackson's uh, journey uh, from enslavement to freedom. Uh, a woman who opted, decided, who was very decisive about self-liberating uh, herself and her family. Too often a story, uh, certainly a story whose perspective is uh, not told and shared enough. So next, um, Alex, we're gonna have um, you queue up the prepared video presentation for the New Calvary Baptist Church. Um, once yeah. we can get that going, okay. And then we will uh, shortly thereafter hear from Robin, Reverend Oliver and Ms. Pridgen. Perfect. I'm pulling up the recording okay. now. All right. Um, sorry, just give me one second. Can you all see that? I haven't started playing yet. Just make sure you can see it. Yes, we can, Alex. All right. And so we will start playing now. Thank you. Hello. I'm Pastor Vincent Oliver, and I'll be your presenter for this afternoon. Assisting me is Miss Edith Pridgen, who will be handling our slides. New Calvary Baptist Church is located in the South Wilmington neighborhood, uh, also known as Southbridge, on a city lot at the corner of South Hill and Pearl Streets. The one-story rectangular building with a raised, finished, full basement was constructed of rusticated cement blocks in 1909. Uh, the church has undergone several adaptations over the years, but retains a large degree of integrity of material, design, and setting, in addition to location and association. This historic church building tells the story of Ukrainian immigration to Wilmington, Delaware at the turn of the 20th century, including the struggles internally to establish doctrinal, doctrinal unity and externally to gain legitimacy and prosperity in America. The building also illustrates the experience of an African-American congregation in Wilmington after the disruptions of slum clearance, failed urban renewal developments, a protracted National Guard occupation of Wilmington in 1968, and related demographic transitions in the Southbridge neighborhood over the course of the 20th century. In the 1890s, Ukrainians began to arrive in Wilmington, seeking job opportunities, and they settled in East Wilmington, where they found industrial uh, metalwork, work in the factories, as well as in the mills. St. Michael's congregation purchased a plot of land across the bridge on South Hill Street in 1906. They did so with funds collected from the community. Building lots on the south side of the river were available and inexpensive, and the area held opportunities for jobs in industry. Bishop Ortensky purchased the South Hill Street property on November 11, 1911. On August 2nd, 1913, St. Nicholas received its charter. From 1928 until 1932, the parish went through turmoil over the deedings of, of church property. 
the opposing faction eventually left St. Nicholas and organized St. Peter and Paul Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The passionate disputes that would soon take the place would soon take place at the church were related to a much broader ethnic and nationalistic tensions. Following World War II, displaced Ukrainians immigrated to the United States in large numbers, often settling in places with established Ukrainian communities. Wilmington received many of these new arrivals, among them a large number of Ukrainian Catholics. During this period, St. Nicholas's membership more than tripled and the congregation rapidly outgrew their South Hill Street building. More and more, ethnic Ukrainians moved away from the South Wilmington area, leaving the increasingly deteriorated buildings and integrated streets of South Bridge uh, for newer home divisions in Wilmington's outskirts. Reverend Richard A. Parker was the founder of the New Calvary Baptist Church. This church came into existence as a result of God's leading of a missionary outreach in 1940. On September 12, 1941, this mission became known as the New Calvary Baptist Church. July 1, 1944, the church moves it, moved its growing membership uh, to 208 Walnut Street. As a result of urban renewal in 1969, the failure of the Popular Street Project A, Months after rioting and violence, New Calvary moved out of South Central City uh, to South Wilmington. On May 1st, 1969, New Calvary signed the deed to the recently vacated St. Nicholas Ukrainian Catholic Church building on South Hill Street. They acquired the building for $35,000. New Calvary uh, Baptist Church, previously St. Nicholas Ukrainian Catholic Church, is an ex excellent example of early 20th century uh, vernacular Ukrainian religious architecture in Wilmington, Delaware. Stylistically, the building reflects the ethnicity and Eastern Rite religion of the group that built it, as well as specific adaptations that reflect the building's Baptist era. The building's architectural evolution began in 1909 and extended to 1970. Soon after the New Calvary Baptist Church congregation purchased the building, they began to adapt it to suit the requirements of its worship practices. As constructed in 1909, St. Nicholas was a simple ornamental concrete block, gable front building, rectangular in form. Embellishment on the exterior was in the form of light-colored concrete lentils, small semicircular window in the gable above the door on the building's facade. Uh, the center cupola, which is a basic onion dome set atop a platform with exposed metal, supports a square brick base. In 1917, a brick vestibule was constructed at the front of the building, thus equipping it with a feature typical of East Slavic churches, one central dome cupola and two smaller flanking cupolas were also added, symbolizing the Holy Trinity. Design shifts on the exterior, including that from a relatively plain concrete block building to one incorporating a vestibule with decorative facade with an arched and then stepped pediment were undertaken during this period. This shift in gable shape from arched to stepped was likely a deliberate decision achieved to achieve a more Romanesque look for one with greater affinities to the Byzantine styling. The interior focal point was the dramatic Byzantine style iconostasis traditional to the Eastern Catholic and Orthodox religions. It contains images on three levels of Jesus and the saints. The center uh, chandelier is characteristic of a feature known with the Ukrainian Catholic churches. The interior of the church, while retaining its overall arrangement of space and some original architectural details from the Ukrainian Catholic era, 
in many ways reflects its denominational shift to a Baptist church in 1969. Chief among these was the installation of a baptismal pool. Constructed in 1969, soon after moving in, it was and is integral to the practice of immersive, immersive baptism, which is a requirement of the Baptist faith. The pool articulates in architecture the denominational's, denomination's requirements of baptism by believers only. The low pat platform on which the St. Nicholas Iconostasis stood was insufficient for the Baptist worship service. The New Calvary congregation therefore installed uh, the platform that is in place today, raised three feet above the sanctuary floor. While this did not change the front facing center aisle layout of interior space, it elevated the focal point of the worship service. The 10 ceiling in, is an example of early 20th century construction and embellishment in imitative materials, specifically ornamental rock face concrete block and pressed metal ceiling decoration. The gambrel ceilings, painted white, retains its original finish with a Victorian floral patterning, effectively mimicking the look of plaster. The three cupolas display a large center, displayed with a large center cupola and a smaller uh, flanking cupolas are in place on the vestibule roof. The tall Byzantine style cross extends from this. Two smaller cupolas, one on either side of the center cupola, are comprised of octagonal a drum surmounted by a low segmented dome with flared edges from which rises a tall Byzantine style cross and later modifications and adaptations making it suitable for Baptist worship. In summary, New Calvary Baptist Church, like the Ukrainian St. Nicholas Church, continues to serve as an important social institution that supports its Southbridge neighbors, offering a myriad of services for community residents, including support with rent and utilities, meals, social services, and of course, faith and fellowship. The two year effort to recapture our history uh, is dedicated to these two persons, Peter Serba, who was a member of St. Nicholas Catholic Church and Lucille McManus, a founding member of New Calvary Baptist Church. Both were instrumental in helping us to tell our story. Okay, thank you. So in addition to this uh, intriguing story presented by Robin um, of an enslaved family's journey to freedom, we have this rich history um, of, of a community of faith, New Calvary Baptist Church. So I'd like to begin there with uh, uh, Reverend Oliver and Ms. Pridgen. And I see a couple of questions coming in. So Reverend Oliver, Ms. Pridgen, and you can unmute yourself now. Um, I, I have a two pronged question for discussion. First of all, um, when you think about the place of New Calvary Baptist Church, this uh, community of faith, within the context of our shared Delaware history. Um, what, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Also, please share with us your, your thoughts and experiences um, as you helped prepare the application uh, to have the church listed in the National Registrar of, uh, Register of Historic Places. So one, your thoughts about the place of your church, your community of faith, in our broader shared Delaware history, and more specifically, some of your thoughts and reflections as you prepared uh, to have this church placed on the register. Well, let me begin first by um, thanking um, some of the, our other friends uh, from the city of Wilmington to the state of Delaware, and um, from the University of Delaware, who 
gave us so much uh, professional uh, advice and expertise. So they have to take some credit for what we have accomplished. Uh, my thoughts happen to go back to those uh, original founding members who just wanted to have a church of their own. I don't think they had a, a, a clue that they were buying and occupying a, a historical um, location that would uh, speak volumes to um, the South Bridge area as well as uh, the city of Wilmington in general. Uh, when we look at what we attempted to began some two years ago, uh, we were simply um, interested in making the connection. Um, what our presentation did not tell you is that some 10, maybe 15 years ago, uh, we sponsored a, a luncheon and we invited some of the former members of the St. Nicholas uh, Ukrainian church to come and those two groups of congregants uh, had one thing in common, uh, the building. Uh, there were some major issues with understanding each other. Their, their language barriers were there. Uh, but what we saw then was there was a story. Uh, there was an evolutionary process between two congregations and one common structure. And as we began to talk to the experts, we began to realize this building was very special. Uh, it's often been called a gem uh, in Wilmington. So, so we're excited about being placed on the National Register and we look forward to uh, sharing our story as many as times and opportunities are presented. Ms. Pridgen? I, I joined a New Calvary Baptist Church uh, coming from a background with Community Presbyterian Church in 2011. And one day after this, I mean, one after the uh, worship service, I just looked around and I said, well, what kind of, this isn't a Baptist style church, <laughs> but just what kind of a church is it? And that kind of got the ball rolling too, to find out. And I started doing the research on it and just found out there are so many similarities between that, uh, the struggles that they had the faith that they had and the victories that they had, they were chased out of the Russian area and uh, we were brought over here, you know, not uh, our ancestors by boat as well. And we had struggles in trying to get our own and keep our own identity, which um, they weren't allowed even to speak in their own language, you know, in the, uh, the old Russia and the Slavic areas. And, um, they were the first um, Greek, Ukrainian Greek Catholic church. And we were the first Baptist church to take over the um, building. So we just had, and it, it, it was a joy to me. It was um, uh, tedious at times, but um, like Reverend Oliver said, the support of the others from the state, the city and the University of Delaware especially with these, uh, the design of the church and the specific things like that, we would probably still be working on the application, but it's been a joy and we're still, we, we're getting a lot of uh, feedback from other churches that are interested in doing that because there's a lot of old churches in that area. And um, you'd have Mount Joy and the other ones, but um, it was it was really rewarding to do that. And all along the way, um, like I told Alex earlier, I said the people have been so patient, so serving, and accommodating with us, and we really, really appreciate that. We have a question, a follow up question, certainly related to what we're discussing now, from uh, Debbie Martin who asks, Reverend Oliver and Ms. Pridgen, how were you and the congregation affected by the nomination process? Well. Shall I go first? <laughs> yes. Absolutely, sir. Well, there is a great sense of pride um, as well as enlightenment. Uh, some of our younger members <laughs> are just you know, surprised to find out 
that we have a connection with Ukrainian Catholics. Uh, we have some friends and some, some individuals who support us in different ways financially. They support our activities and services uh, and they, they're connected with St. Nicholas. So uh, we feel like we are a, a, an ever growing congregation uh, and we're ex expanding and re-identifying ourselves as more than just Baptist uh, church goers. Okay. I, I think another thing with the congregation, it seems like everybody was had a sense of pride and uh, interest and there's been a lot of fellowship and we're doing things in the church to do the restoration, the renovation and all of that. And then uh, when we told other the membership that people had old pictures and just like Mother uh, McManus, she, uh, she is a walking historian of New Calvary Baptist Church. And unfortunately, um, during our first presentation, uh, Mr. Zerber passed away, but his uncle also brought that um, uh, chandelier, the chandelier over when yeah. he first migrated. And um, but it's 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 been a struggle. There have been some differences, but we've learned to pray and come together, and we're still working on getting that done so that we can have everyone to come through to see um, the. Uh, New Calvary, um, uh, Ukraine, the former Ukrainian church um, in its restorations with the cupolas and everything. Yes. So one of our participants has um, an operational question for you. For the New Calvary Baptist Church presenters, Reverend Oliver and Ms. Pridgen, as an active congregation that probably must be careful in prioritizing its funds, what are the biggest challenges in being good stewards and preservationists of such a historical building? Well, our challenges are very easy. We, we have to go out and find new funds uh, for any restoration project that we have. Our operating budget uh, does not support that, but uh, we have a great team of grant writers uh, and researchers who, who have done, even in this short, period of time since we were uh, put on the National Registry, done a great job in generating funds. So uh, it is an entity all of its own. Um, it's high in our priority. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that group works uh, very well with our trustees so that we can uh, make sure that there is a good uh, merging of uh, financial resources. So uh, we're right up there. It's real high in our priority. And somewhat our um, application of the historic features that we have does dictate where the monies will go first and what our priorities are, which we have established uh, with an architect. And um, we're in that process is still ongoing. One more, and one additional question from our colleague, Alex. Do you, Reverend Oliver, Ms. Pridgen, have any um, advice or suggestions for other congregations or groups that might be interested in nominating a property to the National Register? Mm. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Edith. I really do. I think that that building tells a, a beautiful story that we would have never known. And to see so many similarities, it gives you a joy to know that your church, who you, where you worship, where where you love the people that you worship with, it's it it brings it brings you together. It brings you even more together because you have to agree on things, as you know, as you go forward. And I I think I I wouldn't trade that for anything. Yeah, I, I would I would give them this advice: hold on and, and hold tight to your older members. Uh, the ones who've been around, yes. uh, they may not have a lot to say. Mother McManus um, has uh, sort of retired. She was at one time our Sunday school uh, superintendent. She was our church clerk. Uh, she did everything, but she's retired. Uh, but we don't want all of that wisdom and history to retire with her. So 
we sort of pick her brain. I would uh, make sure that that uh, other churches wanting to do what we've done, uh, look back in your past, go through the records, and you may find some people that you don't even associate with directly right now, like the Serbas. The Serbas have become great friends, but we never knew them until we began this process. Mm -hmm. So there are people out there who can contribute, who have information, and they don't look like they, they have it, but, but you gotta ask the right questions and do the homework. And also, I wanted to add that the um, St. Nicholas Ukrainian Church now that's on Lee Boulevard, the congregation and uh, the pastor and everything, they have helped us and gave us some of their history books that, um, and with the weddings mm -hmm. and all of that. So yes, it's, it, everybody just comes to your, your help, for your help. Thank you so much, Reverend Oliver, Ms. Pridgen, for your, um, your experiences, your suggestions and insights. I have a couple Thank of you. questions here for Robin. Uh, Robin, how many historical places seem to have legends associated with them about the Underground Railroad, but without any good documentation to support their connection? Does this cause serious challenges to the NPS program? For example, where people strongly wish to recognize sites that cannot be proven to have underground railroad ties. Yeah, I think um, what we do is move them back to research and give them strategies to try to figure out how it would have fit in the networks that were developed over time across the country. And so um, try to connect them in with other people who have done research. Um, but it's true, um, there are people who are very upset with this program for not recognizing more ephemeral documentation. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so, I mean, there are challenges. Uh, we are in communities where stories abound, right? But for well, to tell you, to tell you the truth, um, mm -hmm. there are regional mythologies yes. that have developed and the Underground Railroad tends to be one of those. <laughs> um, so when you look at this, look at this story and see, is it just that it was, it, how much detail does it have? Does, do they sure. know anything about the people who came through or the people who lived in the property? And then you can drill down into what you do know about the property and find out more and then see what other people studying this topic have learned about how the Underground Railroad worked in that community. Sure. And so you can build a case to either support or refute what happened there. Sure, so as, as I was saying, and I, you're, you're absolutely on point, Robin. However, if I am not an historian, right? I'm not a trained researcher, but I'm in a community where certainly there may be some mythology, but there is a strong oral history. There are stories that abound or are consistent over time. What's my first step in trying to you know, gather, document it, and verify or vet stories associated with the site in my community? Well, I would look for people who were doing re research back as far back as you can get. Like what's the earliest reference to this history in your community, whether it's William Still's work in 1872 or Wilbur Siebert's work around the turn of the, 19, of the 20th century. Go back and see if you can find connections there. Um, but no one in my program is gonna tell you that your community does not have underground railroad connections because it can't be documented. The only thing we can do is withhold Network to Freedom designation until such time as we can find out more. But, the, but like in Delaware, the only people we know who worked on the Underground Railroad or can, can pinpoint are those who were prosecuted, who were found out and brought before justice um, at the time, which we would not necessarily agree with that term, but the, or, or the outcomes. But the, um, this work went on behind the scenes and there's a lot more to know. Mm -hmm. And more comes out all the time. 
So Debbie Martin has two um, uh, NTF questions, Network to Freedom questions. Sure. Sure. First, how many more uh, Network to Freedom applications would it take to change the Delaware map color? And are there sites you identified for the Jackson story that have Network to Freedom potential? I've been, I hope that the Jackson story comes up with a Network to Freedom application out of it somewhere. And we've got to figure out where to do that, whether it's putting another marker up on that corner in Wilmington to, to highlight the, the Underground Railroad work of Thomas Garrett, or if uh, maybe at the Alms House, we could think of some way to, um, to that was a, a crux time that that happened, that in, incident happened. I would love to find out where they were living and try to get a property, get a marker there perhaps. Um, Certainly, if we could, if we could do it in Canada, but it's not under our jurisdiction. <laughs> but definitely, it's clearly um, an amazing story that needs to be told, and I want to find a place to to be able to pin it down. That's my goal, and that's that's as much as I've got so far. Um, as far as the changing the color map, I'll have to research that and get back to you. Uh, we definitely are on the borderline, though. Not many is what I would say. Okay. And for those of our participants who are not familiar with the Network to Freedom map and color, could you um, elaborate? Oh, sure. It's just that the Nash, the, um, the, on our website is a, a map that lists the number of applications that each state has. And they've color coded them by, by the amounts to let you know who has more and who has less. And Delaware is right on the borderline of getting another darker color. So that's the goal is to, um, to compete with what's going on in other states. Okay. We'll have another question uh, for you, Robin, from one of our mm -hmm. participants. Sure. How would you compare the goals and approaches of a Network to Freedom program to the goals of the National Register Program, oh, as sure. far as how sites are recognized and promoted. Absolutely, the, the major difference between the two of them is that the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom does not require a building to be standing. We, we're looking for the places where history happened. Uh, we're not, this is not a building preservation program, although our grants can be used for that. So um, the National Register requires that a building be present in some way or a resource, a historic resource be present in some way. And there's, I can go into the, you don't want me to do that. Um, but, but the National Register has very, very descriptive criteria that I'm sure the Reverend and Mrs. Pridget understand very well um, at this point. Um, but it's basically, we're not about saving buildings, we're about saving the history. And there's a, we're way more flexible about what we'll recognize. Okay, a question for you, Robin, from John Gardner. Are there Delaware Underground Railroad sites that are not public, like Newcastle Courthouse and Old State House, be it African-American or Quaker? that are not, I'm sorry, could you repeat it? I'm sure. not, they're not public, are, are they private? You mean private yes. residences? I they can be, but the Network to Freedom requires um, owner consent. And um, there, I could list you places that I would put in the network in a heartbeat, but because they were places of enslavement that people left from, it's more difficult for a private property owner to wanna to own that history than it is for a public landowner to um, be able to celebrate a wider, a, a wider discussion of what their properties represent. And so that's why our designations to this point are basically about in public sphere, the public sphere. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, they can be. And we would help anybody who was interested in that. I want to, um, for all of our, pr our presenters, and I'd be delighted if some of our participants uh, weigh in on this. So oral history, mythology, intuitive assumptions about the community in which uh, New Calvary Baptist Church is located, right? I, as a Wilmington uh, resident often hear, well, those freedom seekers who came into Wilmington uh, most likely passed through around or near um, Southbridge. And it's, it's a tantalizing thought and, and um, idea. And I'm wondering what some of your, your thoughts are in that regard. That is the possible role of uh, the Southbridge community as we know it now uh, in the um, Underground Railroad and the journey to freedom for freedom seekers. You can go first, Robin. Do you want me to go first? I sure. can gladly do that. Um, what I would do is look at what at the uh, William Still book and see what it's what it says, what it documents about how people got into Wilmington. A lot of what he does say is that it's difficult to get into Wilmington, that the bridges are watched. Um, the, the crossing at Market Street is listed in the Network to Freedom but not at Southbridge, not, not coming in that way. And so that doesn't mean by any stretch that nobody came that way. It's just, what can we put together to, um, to get that um, application together? And that would be who was living in the area, how those connections happened, um, and any clues that we can get from um, those early records like Still and Thomas Garrett's letters. <clears throat> Reverend Oliver? Yeah, I would respond in, in this manner. Uh, South Wilmington is one of the oldest communities in Wilmington, um, but um, I would doubt very seriously if it was a major artery for Underground Railroad uh, passage or, or activity simply because it, it, it has barriers. The, the rivers cut it off uh, in such a way that uh, it's very difficult uh, to move without, um, and, and, and back at, in those days, um, without some kind of detection. Uh, during the, the um, 2020 um, protests, uh, we, we were trying to leave the church and go to Center City uh, to be a part of the protests and, and gathering and rallies, uh, Black Lives Matters and things of that nature. The bridges were raised and we were landlocked in mm -hmm. South Wilmington, uh, which alarmed me to some extent because uh, it showed me just how quickly that entire community can be cut off. Uh, from the rest of the city. So, so ha having experienced that and the frustration of trying to get into Center City, I, I take my own mind back to the days of runaway slaves. And I think they would, they would have avoided that area of the city. That's okay. just my personal observation. Okay. okay, I don't see any additional questions in our chat box. We have um, less than 10 minutes remaining uh, in this session. So I'll, I'll open it up to additional uh, comments, observations, reflections. Otherwise, I'll have to come up with another myth for us to deconstruct. Well, Robin, share with us, and, and again, you've, you've been um, on the ground and up and down, uh, country lanes and in and out of archives and libraries for decades. What keeps you most inspired in this Network to Freedom work? Just the, um, my intense admiration for these people mm -hmm. um, who took their freedom 
and what, trying to tell their stories appropriately. Um, it's, my work is not trying to replace anybody. I'm trying to build a bridge for other people to stand up upon and reach higher. Uh, what can I collect and um, help? people get to the next level. Cause this, as a historian, you understand that we're at a moment in time and we only know what we know, but more will come in the future. So what can I let people understand about what we know now to be able to reach further ahead? Okay, thank you. Are there any other thoughts as we close and conclude our session? I'd just like to uh, express my appreciation for uh, those persons who keep our history um, not only alive, but relative uh, to people who live in Wilmington. I'm not, I'm not a native of Delaware, uh, but this whole process sort of drew, drew me into um, the mind and the, the mindset of a Delawarean. And we have an excellent resource with, our, as I mentioned earlier, our friends at the city who gave us excellent uh, professional advice uh, and at the state level, as well as the University of Delaware. Um, what a great resource for anyone who's trying to uh, do what we, we have attempted to do ourselves. Okay, and thank you. Again, Alex has placed in our chat box um, a link for more information on the Network to Freedom program, should you be interested. And did I see uh, Ms. Pridgen unmute herself? Did, is there something Yes, I wanted to, to um, uh, share my experience in doing some of the research for um, the building. I found that the archives of, uh, of the news journal through newspapers.com they went back and I got a lot of information about the struggles that um, the Ukrainians had. And also on the old deeds, they have, uh, I had a, a deed that was almost as big as a, if a, a side of a newspaper because they tell more details on those than um, just the regular deeds that we use now. So, and I use that and I went to the recorder of deeds of Newcastle County and got a lot of information and found our deed and uh, different things like that. So um, I think that that's a good start for, cause I'm not a researcher, but I, I, I'm nosy and I wanna know. And I was very interested in our church, but I got a lot of that led to other things and um, to help tell our story. Well, Ms. Pridgen, being nosy and wanting to know more are the essential characteristics of a good researcher. Okay. Be assured. Again, thank you all of you for, for joining and sharing your, your research, your experiences, and your thoughts um, on uncovering much of our, um, I guess, forgotten history and recognizing black historical sites in Delaware. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, Reverend Oliver and Mrs. Bridgen. Same to you and keep Thank on you. doing what you're doing. <laughs> Be encouraged Thank with you. your good work. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, God bless. Take care. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Dr. Gooch and Reverend Oliver, Ms. Pridgen and Robin, so much for your time today. That was a oh, fantastic yes. discussion. I enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. All right. Have a great Thank session. You. Thank you. For any attendees that are still here with us, that's it for our events today. But tomorrow at 9.30, um, we'll start our third session. Uh, so I hope to see everybody tomorrow. Thanks so much for, for attending.